All right, cool. Um, so yeah, so I'll also send out these slides um, after class. Because uh, everyone's email addresses, I think everyone got an email from me? Yes? Cool. Um, if you have a different email you want, like, just let me know after class. Um, yeah, so you guys are all here. You know what this is about. Here's my contact info. Um, feel free to reach out to me in any way. Um, if you have questions, like, just respond to that email. Um, got some Twitter and Instagram where like, I post, like, especially on Twitter, I'll generally post other like, inspirational stuff, especially on machine learning. Um, so if you're a Twitter user, like, maybe follow that, because you might see some new stuff. Um, as I'm trying to like, be a little bit more social about like, sharing things that I find that are cool. Um, OK, before we start, I don't expect anyone to be a jerk in here, but like, just know, like, please be nice to each other. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited about here is I think there's lots of people who are working in different creative fields. Um, which means we can probably help each other out. So like, part of this class will be like doing stuff in Photoshop to prep files, um, writing a little bit of code here and there. So like, I assume like we can probably help each other out. So if you are also like struggling with something, feel free to like ask and be like, hey, can someone help me with this? And if I can't, maybe someone else can. Cool. Um, the next question, and you don't need to answer this right now, but like in the future. Um, or like maybe after class, let's talk about this. Uh, I don't know what everyone's schedules are like for the next you know, four weeks. Um, I assume people have jobs, like if people are busy with other things. Um, so it's up to you if you wanna stay in touch or like share work in progress in the middle of the week. Um, I could set up a Slack channel pretty easily if you'll wanna do that. We could do stuff over email. Um, or we just all show up on t next <laughs> Tuesday and like do whatever we want. Um, I'm pretty open. Um, so just like if you have suggestions, like maybe after at, toward the end of class we can talk about this and sort of figure out what we want to do for the following weeks. Um, I find Slack kind of nice because then it's also like after class is over, if people still want to share stuff and talk amongst each other, it's a little bit easier that way. Um, and I don't use email much anymore, but I should also say like if you want to reach out to me, like between now and the end of class, like I'll be I'll try to be pretty readily available. Um, you know, give me a day to respond and that sort of thing. Um, so this is the schedule for class. Um, so the first week we're going to do some inspiration. We're going to look at a lot of like machine learning art projects people are doing. Um, we're going to set up some things. Um, week two uh, is going to be style transfers. I don't know if anyone even knows what that means yet. We'll get there. Uh, week three is going to be cycle GANs. And week four is actually not going to be DC GANs. It's going to be style GANs. Again, I don't expect anyone to even know what those words mean yet. We'll get to it. I'll show some work this week and sort of like point out like oh, this is probably this, this is probably this. Um, these are basically just different types of ways of making art using machine learning. Um, so we'll talk through some of that. Um, cool, so um, it seems like everyone's sort of, no one has basically been like, I want to learn how to make a convolution, convolution neural network, which is great because I'm not going to teach that. Um, but so here's what we're going to teach in class. Um, we're going to teach what is called basic intuitions. Do you guys know what intuitions are? So like from a data science or like math perspective, intuitions are basically like explaining things without using math terms, which is what I'm gonna do. So like I won't get into any math or like very very like very little code as well. Um, I'm just gonna talk sort of high level how these things work and try to like explain using analogies. So you sort of understand what's happening because sometimes like you'll break something or like something will fail and you'll be like, why is that? And if you sort of understand the high level, you can sort of figure out why that is. Um, Second, um, fast, cheap, and goodish, um, which is actually an oxymoron because, or like, this will actually, you will think this is crazy um, because fast, some of this stuff is going to literally take a week of like sitting on a computer. Uh, cheap, this stuff is actually not cheap, it's pretty expensive. Um, and goodish, well, actually, that, that one's probably true. It's actually made goodish. Um, basically, like, so with machine learning, like, but to a machine learning expert, this will be true, and it will be fast, it will be cheap, and it will be goodish. Um, fast, we'll talk a little bit about, um, in that like, this stuff generally takes a lot of time through what's called training. Um, but what we'll do is like, I'll show you sort of like dirty ways to like get something up and running to see if it works, and then we'll go from there. Um, cheap, in the sense that uh, we won't be spending ten thousand dollars on a server, which is like what like some serious data science, like machine learning labs do. Um, we'll be using some resources that already exist on the internet. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. We, basically through paying for this class, you already got some credits. Um, so all your, all the, basically everything you buy should 
like help you like you've already paid for everything that'll help you through this class basically um, you should be able to do everything in this class and that and with the amount of money you spent um, and if you want to do stuff outside of class like there might be some additional fees but that'll be really it it's really weird seeing people just like stop outside here and like stare at you yeah. um, I mean, we, we get, no it's all good it's yeah. just like oh gotta get used to like a random person outside stopping for a minute um, and then goodish so um, well, I, I'll, I'll touch on that again later um, experiment with existing tools so again like I'm not going to teach you how to build your own neural network. Um, I actually don't know how to do that myself. Um, it's kind of great that you don't have to. Um, we'll be using some stuff that already exists on the internet. Um, and I won't make anyone write code unless they really want to. So well, that'll be good. Um, and then we are going to be making images. So the v of course, I deleted that slide. So the reverse of this is like um, in making images, I'll be doing a little bit of video stuff, but it won't be like creating video. It'll be more like taking a bunch of images and turning them into, into a video. Um, and we'll be doing stuff with interaction. So I'll show you um, one, of the, one of the tools we're going to use is called Runway. It has a bunch of libraries already built into it to do stuff like you want to track people's like motion. Um, I won't teach that partly because I don't really know it myself. But it's in there, and if you want to play with it, um, you can. Um, but we're mostly going to focus on making images. Um, OK, so the other thing that, like, I always like to talk about when we start is like, how do I actually want to like work within this class, or like, what should I expect to make out of the end of this? Um, and I think like again because everyone like has different schedules and whatnot, like there's a couple different approaches I would think about for this. So, some of you might try to like come in and like you want to learn it all, like you want to learn style transfers, you want to learn cycle GAN, and you want to learn GANs, and you can do that. Um, my guess is that in four weeks it'll feel really overwhelming. But you should definitely, like, if you have the like wherewithal to try, you should try it. Um, my second option is, like, pick a project. So, like, I'm going to show some projects. And if one of them, like, really inspires you and you say, that's really fucking cool, i got to figure out how to do that. Like, maybe then you spend the next two or three weeks, like, really focusing on, like, trying to do that. Um, and I'm happy to help, like, sort of guide you if it's a little bit earlier in the process than, like, the way that I've scheduled the classes. Um, and then lastly, like, some people will just, like, be like I'm not gonna really make anything. I just want to like sort of sit here, like take it all in, and then like a week later, like or like maybe a month from now, I'll like try to figure it out and how to do it myself. Um, this is actually the last one. Is like so the way I learned this stuff is. Do you guys know School for Toilet Computation? Um, it's Zach, It's one of Zach Lieberman's like projects. Um, I took a machine learning class there about a year and a half ago, and it was literally this for four hours every night with a different instructor for a week. Um, and that was like super intense. So guys like Gene Kogan, um, Allison Parrish, like some really well-known people, like every day they came in and they just like threw everything at you for four hours. Um, you like couldn't make anything overnight in that time, plus I had a full-time job. So like it was really like for five days I just like learned a bunch of stuff, took a shit ton of notes, and I took like six months off, came back to those notes and like actually started to play with stuff. Um, so this, this will work. Um, you'll have all my slides and all my notes, so like, you can always like, come back to this later. So don't feel like if you don't finish everything in four weeks that like, somehow you're like a bad person. Um, it's totally valuable. Will yeah. you give us like, some of those names as references? To look up yeah, there, so, so when I do inspiration, I'm also going to give you some list of names. And I think it needs to be like, a longer list than the, than the names I've given you. But I'll definitely work on that as well. Cool. Yeah, cool. There we go. Slides are out of order. Um, what this class isn't. So I'm not going to teach math or data science. Um, this actually isn't true anymore. Actually, I'm going to teach some state-of-the-art stuff. Um, and it's in part because some of the tools are using like required state-of-the-art stuff. So we'll actually learn some like pretty new things. Like the, the one of the GANs we're going to learn, like literally came out in February. Um, and people are like still trying to figure out how a lot of it works. Um, won't build customer networks. And video interactives will sort of um, do a little of, but not so much. Um, so inspirations. Um, so this is sort of a list of like, these are maybe the people that I would say are like the big people to follow um, in the art world that are like making image-based machine learning stuff. Um, it's sadly pretty male heavy. Um, I would actually say like, there are a couple of like women who I think are really amazing, but they tend to do machine learning around like text synthesis or like more text-based art. Um, so not on this list, but I will. I'll like definitely provide a longer list of things that people should do. Um, 
So this is, again, when you get this, these are all linked to like Twitter accounts or other things for them. Um, but let's, let me just show some stuff. Um, so Mario is probably like the person to know within this field, um, in part because I feel like he's invented certain techniques that like people are now just like straight up him off for him. Um, he does a lot with um, what's called picks to picks, um, which we'll talk about. That's sort of cycle again. Um, but let me just show some of his work. Um, so it might not make any sense for me to, right now, for when I describe this to you, but here's how this works. So basically, he trained a facial record, like a basically bunch of faces. Then he also sort of trained a system of, I don't know if you guys know about computer vision and being able to track people's faces, sort of how they do like Instagram face filters. But basically, he trained a system to understand like faces and then how to convert that facial recognition system into generating faces. And then what, so he's like, he hasn't exactly said exactly how he built this, but people sort of guess that what he did is he creates an image using a GAN, he then tracks the faces, uh, and then he generates a new image based on that face tracking system. So it's sort of this like feedback loop of where as the faces regenerate in different places, it's then also like adding another face and then tracking that face. So like you'll sort of see here like um, when he, uh, when like the faces converge and eyes sort of like separate, that's where you sort of can like imagine that like it's tracking and then because of the creation, it doesn't know if that eye is a left eye or a right eye. And then it sort of splits off into two faces. So this is stuff that like only he, like he probably came up with this like two or three years ago and people are still like, wait, how is he doing that? Um, this is another project of his. So he does these things where, um, and we'll talk about this as we get like into like week three, um, which is like paired images. Um, so again, the system of like, can you take like a facial structure and then generate a face off that? Um, this is what's called um, next frame prediction. Um, and I'll just show it and then we can talk about how he does it. So he clearly trained this, trained this on fireworks. So one of the things that, he'll, that you can do is, if you, you imagine a video as actually just a series of images. Um, what he basically does is he trains the machine to guess what the next image in a, in a video frame sequence is. So he will basically take a firework video, split it into all its individual frames, then pair those images with like image one and image two, image two and image three, and then he trains that. And then all you have to do, then all you have to do is then feed it one image, 
and it guesses every image after that. So you can sort of see here, like at the very beginning, like those are normal fireworks. And then it like explodes sort of into its own thing, right? So part of what's interesting here is like the machine's actually not good at this. Like it's actually kind of bad. It's bad at being able to guess what a realistic next frame should be for fireworks. But because of this feedback loop, it creates this really interesting thing that feels different than like fireworks themselves. Um, and one of the things that we're going to talk about a little bit is like as machine learning like labs and people like their goal is to perfect making perfect images that feel realistic but I think the art community is more interested in like things that do not feel real and that's where there's like this tension right so like as machine learning gets better and better we're moving toward more and more realistic things and into this place of like you, what's like deep fakes or being all fake like makes it so look so real that it feels like a lie whereas like artists are sort of exploring like the other side of it which is like what's cool and like a machine being stupid or like what's interesting about like machines not being good at these things so this is one mario did on fireworks um this is one mario did on um ink in like on paper or like watercolor or something So again, this doesn't look realistic, but it adds like, it's like still really cool in that it's like almost realistic, but almost not. So is it one single image or is it like a video of you, how you're saying one, two, two, two? So it's probably a video, um, especially for these, where basically you take a video, you break it up into all its individual frames, and then the training set is the individual frames. And then to restart this cycle, what you do, so again, this might not make any sense to anyone just yet, but basically there's two steps to every machine learning process, which is like you train a model, and then you like actually test the model. So, he, so the first thing is you train off the video, and then the test is you just give it one image and see what it produces next. Then you take that next image and you see what it produces after that. Um, so this is like a technique that I think he invented, like I've never, I've never seen anyone else do this before him or after him. Um, actually, Kobe will have done it after him. Um, but again, it's so like, this is also why, why I'm really interested in teaching this class, because I think like everyone will have different ideas of how to take two paired images and like what am I trying to teach between those two pairs. So part of what's cool here is like we'll guess at like what we think a machine is going to learn, but what it actually learns is oftentimes different than what we expect it to, right? So like you would imagine like, oh, if I'm teaching this thing to do fireworks, it's going to learn that like a firework starts as a small thing, it explodes, it gets bigger, 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 and it disappears, right? But like what it might actually be learning is that like there are multiple streaks in every video. So like I have to keep having multiple streaks in every frame, right? So like continues that process. So part of it is like we have a different way of thinking than machine thinks. And like we're sort of exploring what what those differences actually are and how to exploit them or like how to even like guess at what it's learning. So I'm kind of thinking of like like a recursive content aware fill. Like yep. Where it's just like there's keep going the same part over and over. Like yeah, so a lot of what Mario does is he works with feedback loops. Right. Um, and that's actually like a pretty common trait. I mean, it's common in generative art, it's common in this stuff too as well. Um, there's another one here, I don't know if this one works on it, but like the other thing is like you could also think about zooming in on an image. Um, and you could try to train a video zooming in, but like is it actually learning to zoom in or is it learning like different layers of abstraction and like the only way you find out is by testing it um, so it's like kind of interesting to sort of think about um, so Helena um, Saren I think I'm pronouncing her name right I don't know I've no, I only ever followed her work on, on the on the internet um, Helena so kind of one of the interesting things about machine learning and you will hear this from a lot of people is it requires a lot of data right so um, when they when they do like base training or like training to make deep fakes, they generally have to train it on like ten thousand images. Um, Helena's work like sort of explores like the opposite side of that of like what do you learn when you train it on like fifty images? So a lot of Helena's work is actually like her own small like processes. Like she'll do some sketches or she'll do some paintings. She'll take photographs of like twenty five of them, and then she'll feed it through like a cyclegan system, um, and like it's sort of like. What do I get when you do that? Um, when we get into cycle games, we'll talk a little bit about like why machine learning experts don't like that and why an artist might. Um, so there's a thing called like convergence, which is basically like 
you'll sort of see all these images kind of look the same, or like you can pull out attributes, like see how this one right here sort of looks like the one in the top left? So like to a machine learning person, that's a bad thing because you really don't want images to look the same, right? Because again, machine learning experts want to be, want to be like, everything should look different and should look realistic. Whereas like this one's basically converging on like one single image. Um, but like to an artist, like do we care about that? Yeah, go for it. Um, as aside from the fact that this is trained on a smaller model, is this also like computationally cheaper to achieve? Uh, like it's the same process? Of interesting. Um, yes and no. So yes in the sense that it takes less time to train. Um, no in the sense that it's still like the same model. So it still takes time like, when you run a process, and we'll look at this uh, over the next couple weeks, like, when you run a process, it takes up a certain amount of, like, memory. Um, so that memory for that particular amount of time, like, let's say an hour, it will always be the same or always be pretty similar. Um, let's say it's 8 gigabytes. Um, so for that hour, it'll always be 8 gigabytes, whether you're doing it on a small model or on a big model. Um, the difference is probably more in that, like, this might take her a day to train, whereas, like, with another thing, it might take a week to train. And we'll, and we'll talk about some of that stuff, too. You just saw a talk uh, by her. Oh, yeah? Oh, awesome. Yeah, she's great. I love her. Um, she does some really interesting work. Um, I'm obsessed with flowers, so I will always show fl floral work. Um, I think this is also great. I don't know what she trained this on. So the other thing is, like, most machine learning artists are, like, generally a little coy about, like, how they make their work. Because the truth is, like, if you have the same data set as someone else, you can basically do the same work. And we'll definitely talk about that next. But, like... I think she might have just photographed flowers herself, right? She might have just gone out and like taken a bunch of photographs and then trained it on that same set. Um, so like that's also what's cool is like, we'll talk about data sets toward the end of class because that's basically gonna be like the homework for the next couple weeks. Um, some data sets require a ton of effort of like going in and crawling through the internet and finding thousands upon thousands of images. But what I like about something like this is like maybe you could go out for like an hour and just like photograph stuff and be done. That's your data set. Um, so like I think that's something worth exploring. I also just love the results of this thing. Like, I think I would I like you know if I didn't know machine learning existed, I would probably spend like hours trying to reproduce this in the three D program, um, and it would never be as good as this. Um, so Robbie Barrett, Robbie's I think like nineteen, which is fucking <laughs> so frustrating. Um, so Robbie was one of the early guys who was like I guess he was probably sitting at home and was like cool I'll figure out how to do this stuff. Um, Robbie built one of the first like art based neural networks um, by like basically forking someone else's work. Um, but he was involved in a pretty con pretty big controversy like maybe a year ago. Um, so he has a he has a pro he has this network that he has up on GitHub. Um, it's called DC GAN Art or something. He provided a bunch of models um, and his work on the left or the or what he like produced coming out of that. Um, the image on the right is what another company used producing his same models, or like we think producing his same models, and they sold it at Christie's for $400,000. So, um, and Robbie was, you know, understandably pretty pissed about that. Like, so there's also this big question of ownership. Like, who owns these models? This is trained on like some open archive of like Dutch paintings. So like, arguably like, the museum who released that might own that stuff too, right? Because it's built on their like their data set. Um, so this will become increasingly like a concern, and we'll talk about it in class. Like, who owns these things? Are you selling it like to make a profit? Are you selling it to like cover your own expenses? Like, there's a lot of questions here about like what is the right thing to do in these cases. Um, uh, it, it was it was actually it got pretty heated between these two groups because Robbie basically had like emails from this group that was basically like asking him how to use stuff. <laughs> so it's like pretty clear that like they were basically just like using a lot of the work that he already made. I don't know that they knew it was going to sell for four hundred thousand dollars, but clearly they put it into Christie's thinking that it was like revolutionary or worth selling. So there's a lot of interesting like discussion within this about like ethics and like how open should you be. Like some of the work I'm going to show you like. I stole stuff off of people's Instagram accounts and used it for my own, like, use it as part of my work. Is it right that I do that? Can I sell that work? Should I let that person know? Should they have a say in it? 
a lot of open-ended questions here, and like, this is a ongoing, increasingly like funky space. Um, I also read some stuff about copywriting models, which is basically like, so Robbie has a file that basically like I could then take from his open source library, put into my own model, export it, and like, could I sell that model? Like, it's Robbie's. I probably could sell it. So there's also like copyright law around like. I guess where they've sort of landed is like me picking out this image means I copyrighted it because I picked out an image from this like vast universe of images it could create. Um, so it's technically owned by whoever like picks out the image, but that's also like pretty weird, right? Because I go through Robbie's models, pick out one of his images. Is it mine now? Is it Robbie's? Lots of like messy stuff. Anyway, I think this is all like to say like this is controversial, but Robbie also does really, really amazing work. He's since sort of moved on past this into like this place where like he's now training Gans on fashion. So basically he would take like a bunch of runway photos. He would then clip them into like an, a white space and then he would train them. And you have a Gan produce like their own uh, like new fashion. And then the next step from that is like, so here is an image uh, of what his Gan produced, which is like clearly like kind of lo-fi, whatever. But he was really interested in like what this red thing was. And he said, why don't we actually make that? So he made a pair of pants that actually has like a pocket on it. So like he's kind of also like, and this is what I think is really cool is like, there are a lot of people who are basically saying that like Gans are not real art because like, you're basically just training a model and then letting the model do all the work. You like, you have no real input, but like, the input is in like a, in, in the training phase, not in the output phase. But what Robbie's doing is really interesting is he's sort of using Gans as like a tool and then he's taking it out into like other space. So what I think he, what, what he said is like, he thinks that this thing was based on like, Everyone holds purses at a certain height. So it's actually a purse, but like the Gan lost the handle. But he was like, that's really cool. Like now there's a purse on your leg. What if we made that? So he actually, like him and his friend who did this project together, like made a prototype of this pant with, with a pocket at the leg. Um, this is work he shared like I think two weeks ago. So he's also like, you'll see that like a lot of art, a lot of Gan artists are really into like old, uh, old masters. Uh, in part because like all that stuff is accessible, so it's really easy to like pull it down and like train it on. But what's cool here is like his model actually only produces like one of these figures at a time. So what he's doing is he's producing one figure, he's producing like millions of them, and then he's cutting them all out and sort of collaging them into a scene together. Um, which I think is again like as we move into more artistic practices of this thing, it's like how do we use this as tools, um, and how do we make these things more than just like a computer model, right? Um, because the truth is, it's really easy to produce computer models. Like, it takes time, it takes money, but it doesn't really take art. So, like, he's sort of doing some stuff that I think is really interesting and, like, moving things into a new category or, like, finding new ways to use these pieces. Um, this is uh, Memo Acton. I think he's doing a PhD in machine learning right now. Um, but this is, like, this is one of my favorite pieces, and I'll just show it to you and we can talk about it after.
Was this made like in real time or? So I don't think this is real in real time. I think like it's probably he recorded this video, split it up into images, and then sent it through the system. Um, he does have some code on how to do this. I've never really dug into. Um, so this is I'm almost positive what's called a cycle GAN, which is what we'll do in the third week. Um, so cycle GAN. So remember how I was talking about um, with Mario's work, you pair images. You say here's image one, here's image two, here's image two, here's image three. CycleGAN uh, takes two sets of images, but they aren't paired. So my guess is that what he did is he took a bunch of photos of essentially like this setup. So here's a yellow cloth, here's a blue cloth, here's some wiring, here's me my hands. Um, took a huge, probably took like a thousand pictures of that. And then he paired it with like a bunch of images of sea storms or flowers or flames. And basically, you throw it at a machine, and you say, "Cool, you learn what what should be like, what the connection is between these things." Um, and that is like that's a cycle game. Like when that came out, people were like, "Holy shit!" What like the machine can figure out how to pair these things together. I'll show an example of this. Um, that's called zebra to horses, um, and it does it literally converts horses to zebras. It's pretty pretty cool. Um, but like this is amazing because like you really don't have to set up too much here, right? Like you take a bunch of photos, you find a bunch of photos of flowers, and you just like, you're like, here you go. Like you figure it out. It takes time to train it. It will often fail. Like I'm actually surprised at how good his results are here. I don't know, maybe he's got some techniques that none of us know about. Um, but like, it's pretty interesting, right? That you could like basically tell a machine like, hey, here are two folders of a thousand images. You gotta figure out how to, how to match them. Or you gotta figure out how they work together. So he trains that, and then he like probably records the video on the left, like breaks it up into a bunch of single images, and then sends that image, each of those images, through the model to, to see what happens. Um, there's probably some techniques about like, so one of the things you'll see as we play with this is like to keep all those waves consistent is like pretty hard, but he's probably like there's some ways to do it. Um, but yeah, I think this is just cool because like how lo-fi was this to produce this, right? Like it didn't take much, like. You can imagine trying to make this with like 3D models or like any other thing. Like this was like super low fi but also like the results are wonderful. I think it's also great that he paired the two together so you could really see like, you know, his hand flame is a flame for a little bit and then he takes his hand away and it still works. Um, pretty cool. Do they know how he did the transition like between the ocean to the? Uh, he basically just switched the model. Oh. Okay. So he so he probably trained a model on this scene and then you know, waves and rocks. Then he did another model that was this scene with flames. So like, you basically create multiple models using those two, the, those training sets. And then like, I, said, I don't think this is real time. Right. So I think it's like, you probably Composing. split out the first quarter of it with this model, then did the second quarter with the other model. Like, gotcha. um, I bet you could almost get to real time now. Um, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be that fast. Yeah. So he probably did it like frame by frame and then stitch it back together. Um, last person we're going to talk about as named is Mike Taika. Um, Mike, I think he worked at Google for a while. Um, he's one of the guys who invented Deep Dream. Do you know what Deep Dream is? So it's like the one where like base is super hype, like psychedelic, where like you can show images and it looks like puppies or it looks like really crazy colorful stuff. Um, but he's done a lot of stuff in other things in the space. Um, so the thing on the left is a style transfer. He's actually got some really good stuff about how to make style transfers interesting rather than like the boring shit that you see a lot of people do with it. We'll talk about that next week. Um, this image on the right was one of the early things of what's called super resolution, which is basically the idea of like, so again, if you're just training two images to each other, like you can think about that in a lot of different ways. So super resolution is basically the assumption that like, so the other thing about a lot of these models, to back up for a second, is that up until maybe this year or the year before, they produced like 64 by 64 pixel images. It was very computational heavy. So they were trying to figure out how do I blow that up to like a 1024. So they figured out is you could pair images by actually training a high resolution version and a low resolution version and then running it together. So you could then take a low resolution image and have it bigger. I'm gonna show there's actually like a really cool app um, that we might use in this class that productionalizes that idea. Um, but anyway, this is like basically him taking a very small picture of a person and blowing it up. And like all the artifacts are not like the same artifacts you get in a Photoshop uh, scale up, but it's like 
really interesting in that you get like these hyper resolution details, but they're like not human. Um, it's really interesting stuff there. Um, so those are like probably like the five or six like people that I always look for. Like anytime they tweet, I like immediately look at what they're doing. Um, but there's so many people working in this space now, and I think it's more and more becoming common. Um, that I want to show just some other cool projects that I thought were interesting, um, starting with myself because obviously like I don't know. Maybe you don't care that I'm that I'm here. They're like, whatever. This guy just knows what he's doing. Like, I don't care what he makes. Um, but this is a style transfer. I did this three years ago now. Um, so style transfer, there's a lot of apps you can just like feed stuff to on the internet. Um, and this was like before I knew what I was doing, so I just feed it into like an app. This is like Helvetica, which is just like black letters and white background, fed through an image that I produced. Um, so like, what I like here is like again, like this is pretty much all my own work. Um, but it is sort of like taking my own work and like trying to scale it or do something different with it. Um, and what I think is also cool is like, this is just black and white lines. So it's just like really like silhouetted work, but then it's like become really textural and other things. Um, so when we do style transfers, like that's what I'm gonna touch on. So like style transfer is like a whole of a medium is basically like a shitty face filter, right? It's like turn yourself into Picasso or other things. But there's actually a lot of like capabilities within style transfer that no one really ever plays with. Um, that I think will be really interesting. It'll be like a light introduction to how to do machine learning stuff next week. So I think it'll be fun. Um, there's another guy, Refik Anadol. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Um, he runs a studio that produces a lot of generative art. He has like a very like, you know, you have like those Twitter personalities where they seem like they're like holier than thou. Yeah. That's kind of him. I don't know if that's actually his vibe or like just how he produces himself on the internet, but like. It's a little weird. It kind of it can bum me out sometimes, or like just frustrate me. Um, but like he's doing some interesting work with him in his studio. So I think this is a bunch of images of Copenhagen. Um, and like we'll talk about this when we get into GANs. But essentially, this is like a really in simple technique, where all you do is like you train it on a bunch of images. And what is actually produced in the model is actually a space. Like think of it as like a three D space and that each one of those points in space is a different image. Um, so really all he's doing is he's animating through a space and taking out all the images from that and then turning it into a video. And like conceptually this is pretty interesting, right? Like imagining how a city can morph over time. Like Copenhagen I'm sure is a city that's existed for centuries. Um, you know, I don't know exactly what his idea is with the piece of art, but I think it's pretty interesting and like there's some interesting sort of moments in it. Um, I actually don't know who this person is. I think this got retweeted into my timeline and I thought it was really interesting. Um, but Kishi Yuma, uh, apparently, I think he does a lot of stuff with um, GANs. Um, this is clearly a GAN. Um, so this is the same thing. Um, it's just navigating through that three-dimensional space. Um, but again, what I like about this is it feels so, like you can make this data set in an hour, right? Like get a blue backdrop, get some friends and start to like photograph people's hands together. Um, and the outcome is like maybe not the most exciting or like most like visually, like it's interesting in that it animates, right? Or it's interesting in like the moments. Um, but it's like pretty simple. Like I bet we could do this as a class project. Like it would seem doable. Um, which I think is again like some of this stuff feels like it's so far out there that it's like I'm never gonna learn this. But like this seems like something we could do like in a class. Um, so we also talked a little bit about like, can I train this on my own uh, system of art or like my own like corpus of artwork? Um, do you guys know Eboy? He was like big like in the early like zero zeros. Um, assuming he's still making work. Um, someone, I don't know if someone had a collection of his work or like if he has a collection on his site, but someone basically pulled down all his artwork um, and then trained it. And so here again, like this is the navigation through ZSpace. But what I think is cool is like the pixel representation stays like pretty consistent. Um, so this is actually the library we'll work with. It's called StyleGAN. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about like why StyleGAN is a little bit cooler than other GANs that I would have initially taught. Um, yeah, I mean this is pretty interesting in that like someone just took a bunch of his own his images and like tried to see what a machine thought about them.
Uh, again, this is a new person I just started following on Twitter. Um, so when we get into picks to picks on CycleGAN in week three, we'll talk about segmentation. Um, the basic idea is that, so again, we've got two images side by side, right? And we're sort of training you to think about how those represent, right? So one of the things, and I'll actually, maybe I'll pull up an image of this in a minute, um, is if you train a segmentation map, so segmentation map is basically like make, so a lot of what you'll see is like on a street view, they'll be like, make a car blue, so they'll fill in a blue like outline for the car, make the road yellow, so they'll like paint the, the road yellow. Um, you then train like this like flat like representation with segment segments or like a map which basically says this yellow represents a road, this blue represents a car, and then you like train them together. Then what you can do next is you can actually like just draw outlines of shapes and fill them in with those colors. And you can train it and you can like then rebuild those images from those shapes. I'll show an example of that because I think it's actually really interesting um, when we get into the, some of the demo stuff. Um, but basically that's what this person did here. I don't know what they did exactly to like train the thing, but so what you're seeing is like an old 80s game, and then here is like the representation of like when it's run through a segmentation map, like what it produces. Whoops. <laughs> so I really don't even know like what they trained this on. I don't know what these images were. They look kind of like Mad Maxian. Like I don't know. Um, Pretty interesting. I could probably reach out to the guy and find out, but I think it's like a really interesting idea. Again, like this is where artists are really cool because they take like, hey, there's a cool game. Like, what can I do with this game? That's right. Like, this is again video. What can I do with this video? Break it up into individual images. What can I do with that? Right. So like, machine learning like experts are like generally pretty boring people, and they will like just they'll only care about like faces or like other things like. But artists actually are really interesting in like finding where like the exploration of the space could really be interesting. Um, speaking of faces, um, so this is so Nvidia, which is the company that makes all your graphics cards for computer games and like your computer. They're one of the big people in the space. I'll talk a little bit about why. Um, but it's basically like it turns out the way they build a gaming a game a gaming graphics card is also really good at doing machine learning. So basically, they now have a lab that just like produces these things. Um, so they're trying to figure out how to like move this stuff into the future. Um, so this is, I guess, probably a year old now. So this isn't really state of the art, but this is basically like this is what video stuff can look like now. So again, they tend to be obsessed with how to like make things look realistic. So this is, none of these faces are real. These are all trained. These are all like generated images. Okay, whatever, I don't care. Um, oh yeah, this is where they are now. So like now it's like way more like realistic looking. Um, and like a year later, they're actually even further along than this. Like these, you can kind of tell the hair looks really shitty. Now they've like produced like perfect looking hair too. So like, it's like, that's kind of where like certain people in the industry are moving toward is like how do I make this thing look realistic? How do I produce this thing that looks so real that like people can't tell the difference, right? Um, but like, I don't know, it's fine. Like someone like goes through and looks at all the Airbnbs and tries to produce like a real looking room, or um, there like there's different there's different models for these things. But their whole point is like how do I make stuff look as real as possible? Um, I think again, this is where artists are more interesting because we're not trying to like create real-looking sky. I mean, maybe we are trying to like, make real-looking cats, and that's pretty cool actually. Um, but like again, like this is sort of what state of the art um, people are looking for. I think what's really funny is actually if you look at um, some of pause, hopefully pause the right. So you notice how the cat images. So they pulled this data set and it has memes in it, right? So like that's actually like been trained on a meme. And they've learned, like, the machine has learned how, what text should sort of look like. Like, it looks like Russian right now, but it's like, they were trying to learn how what text should look like. Um, so again, like, you can also see where people's data sets are coming from when you stop in these places. And we'll talk a little bit about, like, data sets and, like, when you're making faces, it turns out if you make a, if you train the set on a whole bunch of white faces, you're gonna get only white people. So, like, that's kind of fucked up, but, like, 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the other thing is like, uh, this is not gonna work. So um, why are why are we obsessed with faces? So one is because it's a really cool trick, right? Like when you release this stuff, you're like, wow, that person looks real. Like these people must be doing really great stuff. Um, out of here for a second. Um, so it also turns out that we take a shit ton of photos of people's faces. So there's a lot of data available. Um, most of these are trained on celebrity photos. So they go to like one of those paparazzi sites, and it turns out like from a movie, from like a movie premiere or whatever, there's like hundreds of thousands of people's faces photographed. So they, so one of these like research labs will basically like have an intern go out and cut up all the faces to the exact same proportion and shape. Um, so they have, you know, there's data sets of like 20,000 photos of people's faces. So like access to data is really easy. Um, the second thing is actually like, we've kind of found out that it's really easy to fake good looking images of faces. Because if you think about it, like if you were to perfectly represent like in a square someone's face, like the difference between like all of our faces isn't really that different, right? Like our eyes might shift a little bit or our noses might shift up and down or get a little bit longer or whatever, or like our hair color. Like the reason all that hair looks so hard is because actually our hair is the most different thing about us. Um, so when you take these models and like train them on things that are not faces, it turns out they're not great. And it's because like people over-index to like prove that it works with a face set. Um, and then lastly, surveillance. It turns out that like if you can train a face to be fake, you can also then learn what a fake face looks like. So you could actually like train to like see if someone's actually faking like a sex tape or some of these other things. So like surveillance is actually really, really important with all this stuff. Um, unfortunate truth of like a lot of these machine learning labs is like governments and other places are paying a lot of money to learn how to do this stuff so they can surveil, you know, their citizens or whatever. Pretty dark, but also truthful. Um, yeah, so when you see stuff with faces, like my personal belief is like, I don't want anyone working on faces in here. It's boring. It's like fine if you really want to do it or if you want to like, Explore what actually happens if you have a different person, like a person of color in the, in the data set, and actually see what happens. Like that would actually be an interesting project. But like this stuff is like, you can do this like with your eyes closed essentially now. All right, um, how are we feeling? Do we want a break? It's eight o'clock, good? Okay, if, anyone's, if everyone wants a break, feel free. Okay, um, I'm gonna quickly run through some terminology. Um, I literally describe this as like, if you tell someone that you take a machine learning class and like they're an engineer and probably a bro, like they'll be like, oh really? What did you learn about machine learning? Like they'll try to like trick you into basically being like, you didn't actually learn machine learning. So I'm gonna give you some like terminology you will hear people talk about. It really doesn't matter if you know any of these terms. Like I'll use them and you can just be like, wait, what? And I'll just like rephrase it. It's fine. Um, but we'll talk like, you'll hear me talk a lot about models and networks and those sort of things. And like if you're ever confused, just be like, Hold up, can you just explain this in like normal terms? I'll be happy to. Um, data set, okay, so we talked a lot about data sets. Um, for this class, it literally just means a collection of images that you're gonna train a machine on. We'll talk a lot about this like as we go through class, because this will end up being like the most important thing for us as, as a group. And like for you as an artist, like this is the special sauce in like creating different machine learning things. Um, so here's why I'm teaching the class in the order I'm teaching it. So with style transfers, you need at most, or at minimum, two images. Uh, for cycle GANs, you really need about a collection of 100 images. And for GANs, you need about 1,000. Um, and we can play with this and sort of explore how true this is. But like to get good results, I would say this is true. So next week, you need to find a couple images. Should be pretty straightforward. In two weeks, you need to find 100 images, and in, by the end of the class, you want to find 1,000 images. This is going to take time. Yeah, go for it. For the 100 and 1,000, they like, can they be vastly different, or are you trying to get a collection that's like? Right. Um, so that's something worth exploring, but mostly, like especially in GANs, you want them to all be the, pretty similar. And I'll show you some examples of like the data sets I've built, um, and that'll hopefully give you some ideas about like. Where do I start looking for these things? How do I find them? How do I pull them down? Like, how do I create them in a similar like process? Those sort of things. Um, I'll also show like I have some scripts that can help like automate this work. Like, one thing that people do pretty generally is like you can go on someone's Instagram account and download every image they pr produced on Instagram. Um, and for artists, that's kind of cool. Again, like gets into ethical problems, but like if you just want to play with stuff, like that's a thing you could do. Um, 
for cycle GAN, so we talked about these pairing images. So the thing is you want basically two categories. You want a category of A and a category of B. Um, so like within the 100, it's like 50 and 50, or 100 and 100, like about the same amount. It doesn't have to be the exact same, um, unless you're literally doing pair to pair, but again, we'll talk about that. But just so you keep this in mind, like this is something to think about, like start thinking about what you might produce because it might take you a week or two to actually get to this place. Um, and you might have to spend a couple hours like actually finding things. Um, and I also have some links to like some people have collected, like here are a bunch of data sets. So if you just want to play with someone else's, like you can do that as well. Um, training, so I've talked a little bit about training. So there's sort of like three major steps to um, any machine learning model. One is to make the network, which is like code stuff that we're not ever gonna do. Two is to train it, and the third is to test it. Um, the test is like, to a machine learning expert, the testing is like proving the thing works. To us, that's actually the art that we're outputting from it. Um, so training is that middle process, and training is taking a data set, feeding it to a machine's network, and saying, hey, I would like you to learn something about this. And what, what you learn is different amongst those different processes, but the idea is just like, hey, like, can you learn some things from this? Um, so here again, um, with each of these processes, uh, processes, whatever, whatever you, how you ever use that word, um, here's training times for each of those uh, networks. So in a style transfer, we'll do it live in class next week. It literally takes a couple of minutes. Um, that's because you're actually training stuff. But for this, like, I'm willing to fudge it because it like makes sense to us. Um, cycle GANs, like hours up to days, depending on resolution, depending on how many images you have, depending on how hard it is to actually like understand the difference between those two. Um, and then GANs takes days. If you want to, so you can now do 1024 by 1024 pixel GANs. Um, and if you use the servers we're using, it'll take a month to train it. So we will not be doing 1024 by 1024, we'll be doing like 128 by 128. Um, but if after class you wanna do that, like you can do that, it's totally possible, but it takes time and it takes money and it usually takes a big data set. So we'll talk about some of this stuff. What do you mean it takes money? Um, I'll touch on that in like five minutes, okay. but basically like we are renting servers from a company that's probably using Google and you rent those servers by the hour or by the minute, and there's a cost associated with that rental. So uh, I'll jump into, I'll talk about it now, but like the servers we're gonna use this week this, for this class cost about 75 cents an hour. So if you were to train a thing for a month, if you do that multiplication, it's like, uh, it's like hundreds of dollars. So the cost associated with that. Um, I think you said you have your own GPU, so you could potentially like maybe do it yourself. Um, but you had to buy that. So it's like, the cost is, is like, it's gonna come from somewhere. Um, but yeah, we'll talk a little bit about price and like what that equates to in a little bit. Um, model, so um, what I always, what I describe models as is like when you train a network, what you get back is a model. That is a representation of how the machine understands the data you fed it, right? So you talk about this thing that's this like three dimensional space that you can then navigate and like each of those different points is a different image. That's because basically what the machine has done is it's taken all of the info you've given it and tried to make a coherent model of how it understands the data you've given it. And then it sort of does that by like, it's not really three dimensions, it's actually like multiple dimensions, which is like impossible for any of us to think about. But basically it's like thousands of dimensions and each of those has a different point and like each of those has a different idea of what the representation of that thing is. Um, you don't need to worry about any of that because we're just gonna like play with it. You don't need to actually like, honestly the truth is like no machine learning person knows what these models actually look like. We're like, it's very hard to figure that out. We also don't even need to worry about that. All we care about is outputs, which is great. But if you hear the word model, they're talking about, so also the other thing is like, machine learning people talk about models in two different ways. They talk about model as the thing that has been output, but also the thing that is represented, like that is the network that's built. It gets tricky. Doesn't matter. Network to me is like the code stuff. So that's like a machine learning person decided that the way to build a certain network is to combine like these certain layers. We'll talk about layers next. Um, again, this is just like, just know this is like, this is the code stuff that you, we will never touch in this class. Um, and then lastly, like someone will probably tell you that like, oh, with machine learning, are you learning deep learning? Are you learning statistics? Like what are you learning? We're learning deep, deep learning. 
Um, essentially what deep learning is, is it's that our networks have layers. And I'll show an example of that and I'll explain it like lightly. Uh, the reason it's called deep is because there's layers and like normal humans don't really know what's going on in those layers. Um, so that's deep. Yes, it's like, you're like, really? That's it? Like, that's all it is. I promise you. Um, this is what a deep learning network looks like. This is what a really simple one looks like. You don't need to learn anything about what this model represents. Like, straight up, like, it does not matter, but you will probably, like, if you, like, Google, like, machine learning neural network, like, you'll see something that looks like this. And literally all this is, is, like, so we're taking this image here, and, like, on the left-hand side is just literally every single pixel from that image. So this is, I think, a, what would that be, 28 by 28 or something like that? Yeah. So this is, like, literally every pixel um, that's being fed into this network. On the right-hand side is the guess whether what number it, it represents. Everything in the middle are the layers and the deep layers. And, like, for this data set, people know what's going on in these deep layers. But, like, for other networks that, like, these layers might actually be 16 layers deep or, like, 34 layers deep. Like, no one really knows what's going on in here. This is where the machine is learning, learning stuff. And what it's learning is it might be learning, like, so in this particular image, like, the rational way that a human might think about this is like, oh, they're learning what a hook looks like at the top. Or they're learning what that baseline, like, straight line is, right? But, like, what a machine actually learns inside of here is vastly different than that. But, like, you can think of it as that. Like, they're learning a way to represent each of these numbers. Um, and the way it learns is, like, literally you feed it, it learns, it guesses, you tell it it's wrong, and then it, like, changes its network in the middle. So, again, that's all you need to learn. Like, don't worry about anything else beyond that. Um, but that's essentially, you'll see this drawn a lot, or you'll see someone talk about layers, and that's all we're representing here. Um, so, literally, with another image, like, um, if we were to feed it like a picture of a face, it would just be like every single pixel of that face, all the layers that could represent what that face could be, and then like an output of whatever you're outputting it to. So it could be like another image, it could be classification, is it a man or is it a woman? Um, people do different things, and the output is basically like what you want out of it. Um, yeah. So this is like the deepest we'll get into talking about this stuff. Um, and don't worry if it doesn't make any sense, because it, I had to learn this like four or five times before it ever caught on to me. Um, I will say there's a really cool video series where I stole this image from. Um, I have it linked in the notes, but if you wanna like, it's like probably like an hour and a half of like a couple different video series, but if you wanna like actually understand how a machine learns stuff, that's probably my favorite series, um, and it's in the notes. Um, so the other thing that's important to know about um, each of these processes is that um, the outputs are pretty low res. So if you're used to working in print, and you're used to like 300 DPI, you'll be very disappointed by these numbers. Um, style transfers can do about 1,200 pixels, like tall or long or square. Um, cycle GANs and picks to picks are like 512. There are some bigger models. And then GANs, like up until maybe a year or two ago, was mostly at the very low end. They've now figured out how to do that, the really high end stuff or like very high end by meaning like a thousand pixels. Um, and that is like, I mean, it seems low res, right? Like you really can't do much with it. The problem is um, the reason that we're only at this point is because um, this is like a computational power thing where like, so uh, back to this image. So a 28 by 28 image converted to 784 inputs. So that's like a 28 by 28 pixel image is like that small, right? Um, you take 1024 by 1024, I don't even know what that comes out to, but it's in the, it's probably in the, it's in the millions, right? Maybe in billions. So like you now have way more inputs. Um, and it's actually really, really hard to now create a layered set that can take all those. So basically like the machine is like, I can't do this. Um, so as we get faster machines, as we get faster, like smarter networks, like we'll be able to do this. But like right now, it's like, I mean, literally when I started about a year or two ago, 128 was like huge. And I was like, I can't do anything with this. Like, how am I supposed to print this thing? Or how am I supposed to like show this? Like even on Twitter, it like shows it that small. Um, there's another program I talked about. I'll actually demo it really quickly. Yeah, I got time. Um, I'll demo it toward the end of class. It's called Gigapixel AI. Um, and it basically has been trained to like take images really, really big. 
Um, and it does stuff a little better. You know how in Photoshop, if you make an image larger and larger and larger in Photoshop, it gets blurrier and blurrier and blurrier? So Gigapixel AI um, will generally remove those artifacts and actually add in new details. Um, and the way you do that is by training an image, uh, training, training a network to like look at a big picture and then look at a small picture you made by hand, right? So it's almost like photographs them with a really high-end camera and you get 4,800 pixels, 6,000 pixels. And then in Photoshop, actually scale it down. And you now have like a representation of how an image changes from really high to really low. So what you're doing is when you feed it through this Gigapixel app, it actually is trying to do the reverse. So it learned what all those details from like a very small, like a one pixel square, what happens when I 10X that? It trains it on a huge set of, of like professional photography. Um, so it has learned all those details. We're like, it guesses at what those details should be. Um, what happens when you put different images? Like, oh, I, well, they didn't, they didn't do that in the training, but yeah, I'm sure you could actually do that and like, be like, what, what happens? Um, so, I'll just, so I'll show some images of stuff work that I've done that have run through this, and I tend to run illustration work through it, and it gets weird because it's trained on photography, so it's trying to convert a photograph to a, it's trying to convert an illustration to a photograph, so it'll add in like details that like really shouldn't exist. Um, it's kind of interesting, but again, like this is a thing of like, once you understand what it's been trained on, you understand why things don't work, or like why things do work. So one of the other things that's really interesting is like most of the stuff has been trained on like images, like photographic images. So generally when you try to feed it like illustrations, it has no idea how to work. Because everything has been built around like how, how a photo should work, right? Um, so it's kind of interesting that like, that's also the reason why you see a lot of photographic work that works. And like, so Braulio gave me a bunch of his images, which are like pretty like illustrative. And I tried to make some with it and it just failed immediately. And we're like, why? And it's like, oh, well, duh, because it's not photographs. Um, so we'll play a little bit with that. Um, the new, the new GAN that I'm gonna tr that I'm gonna teach you guys about is actually a little bit better at doing stuff like that. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Like again, like all this stuff is built out of like historical things about like so machine learning as a whole came out of basic photography or like uh, computer vision, like understanding what things are through like a small camera. Um, that is sort of how a lot of this, these networks grew. Um, so it's always been thought of about pictures. It's never been thought about like illustration or other things. Um, so maybe someday someone will actually be smart enough to realize that like there's a whole industry here that isn't working with photographs, and we should figure out how that works. But we'll see. What if it's an illustration based on a photograph? Um, so actually, so again, like what what these neural networks care about are pixels. So it just depends, like, are the pixels, like, photographic in their representation, or are they, like, flat? Like, so basically, if you were to feed, like, a flat vector image into one of these networks, it really wouldn't know what to do. It just, like, doesn't, it's like, I see a white pixel, I see a black pixel, I see maybe a couple grays between there, but, like, what am I actually learning here? So actually, one thing that, like, so the other thing I'll say is, like, what's cool about this class is we could actually just try that. <laughs> like, why don't we just, like, give a whole bunch of flat vectors to it and see what happens? Um, because no one's done it. Like what's sort of cool about this like area is like you are probably a group of students who have like no one's, you are like a small group of people who are like in an area that like no one's really explored yet, right? Like they're just starting to teach us in colleges. Um, we're just starting to explore like what these things are. Like the reason that Mario is so good is because like Mario works at Google and has been given basically free reign to like use Google servers and to like explore what art could be with this thing. Like most of us don't get that opportunity. Um, <laughs> so Mario actually like has an interesting past of also doing work that relates to this. Um, he works for a lot of museums where it was like archiving stuff and then also automating, automatically guessing what those things are. Um, so he was sort of already set up to do this work. Like basically like he was already working on this stuff, and like then this thing came along. He's like, "Oh, I've got the, I've got all the data sets." Um, there's a really cool lecture that I should also link um, to of Mario's that shows some of his work, even before he was doing GANs, and you can just sort of see like, "Oh yeah, this guy was made to do this stuff." Like it like makes so much sense. Yeah. Um, cool. So uh, this is everything I basically want you to learn in this class, like out of today's work. I have some other like so the thing I wrote maybe a year ago. That's basically like, if you want to learn more about this, like here are the resources I recommend. 
Um, so if you want to learn more about how neural networks work, there's a link to there to like the best videos I've seen in there. Like I've watched a lot of different videos, and some of them are very math heavy, and I like have purposely been like, yeah, dude, you don't need to watch those. You're learning those. Um, but there are some things I think is really are really good. There's a guy by the name of Gene Kogan um, who has a class called Machine Learning for Artists. Um, he teaches it like I think he teaches it at um, ITP. Um, he recorded all of his class lectures. Um, he is like, you want to learn stuff from from anyone about this area? Like, I basically learned all this stuff from him. So like, if you want to like go direct to the source and skip me, like he's the guy to, to talk to. Um, he runs a site that has repositories of other works, like tutorials, like all these other things. Um, I would definitely recommend if you like this class and you want to learn more and you want to see other things, like he's probably the next stop to go to. Um, and he also just like he also runs a Slack channel that's called it's called Machine Learning for Artists. Um, where there's a lot of other artists that are doing stuff in there, you can ask questions in there. Um, so yeah, I think like that's probably the next step if you really want to go on there. He also looks at like interactive stuff. He's really into interactive work, um, which is not something I'm interested in, but like he will do a lot more with that. Um, yeah, so I'll share the I'll share these slides with you guys, and then we can sort of look at stuff. Um, and like feel free to email me or message me or whatever you want to do um, after that. Cool. So now let's talk about like how we're actually going to build this stuff. Um, so the tools we're going to use. Um, paper space. That is our servers we'll use. Um, they're supposed to get back to me today. They didn't. We'll set it up. Uh, we'll get started on setting up, and then we'll like. I'll actually help set stuff up uh, next week. Um, Runway, which is this really cool new app that literally came out like three months ago. Um, the guys are here in Brooklyn. They actually work out of the paper space space. Oddly enough, um, they basically have a GUI for all this stuff. So it's like a. It's almost like Photoshop. It's not exactly like Photoshop. Um, but basically, they have an interface where we can play with some of these things. This is really great to like just start and play with stuff and see what works or see what doesn't. Um, we're going to use Photoshop. We're going to use some image scripts. Um, we're going to use Terminal. How many people in here have used Terminal before? OK, all right, cool. I will make it as easy as possible on everyone. Um, I'll just give you the commands you have to write. But there will be a little bit of learning. It's fine. You can break stuff. Um, you can also delete your whole hard drive with Terminal, but like I won't give you that command. So don't Google how to do that. Um, you won't. I promise you won't break anything too badly. Um, how many people have work machine? Is it, how many people are, machines are like paid for by work? I have one, but I also have a personal computer. It's just it doesn't. I mean, work, so we should be fine. But like you know, your 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 IT people may reach out to be like, hey, what are you installing over there? Um, yeah. So are these only um, like Apple based? No. So paper space. Um, we use the terminal to log into it. So you can do it through, my, through anything. Uh, Runway has a Windows application. I'm not sure how well it works. We may find out. Um, and then yeah, like the rest of this stuff is, as long as you, have you ever run terminal commands from Windows, like bash scripts or whatever? Cool, so you're fine. It works um, on Windows, Runway, ML. Yeah, it does. Um, I've heard there's some bugs in it, but I yeah. don't know firsthand. OK, awesome. Um, additional tools, so FTP client. Um, that's the easiest way to like pull down images. Um, I use Terminal, or I use Transmit, which is a paid for application. There's also a free one called CyberDuck, and I'll show you how to use it. Um, but if you have one, that's great. If not, it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll download one for you. And then Gigapixel AI um, is a $100 app. You're welcome to use the version I have for now. So if you want to like res up an image to print it, like send it to me. Um, but if you want if you end up finding you really like it and you want to use it, like it costs 100 bucks. They do a sale like every couple months. It's where it's $75. It's a one-time fee. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, it used to be really, really shitty, and now it's awesome. Um, maybe they'll watch this and be like, thank you. Um, you but it's actually way better now. Yeah. Do you get updates on it as they update yeah. it? Yeah. So you're using Gigapixel just to scale up 28 by 28 image or whatever. Small yeah, and yeah. And I'll, and I'll, show, and I'll, I'll show that in a minute. Um, cool. So here's what you get from this class. Um, so when we create our paper space accounts, um, you guys will get credits for $100 worth of, of time on those machines. Um, those machines, you turn them on and you turn them off. Uh, so make sure that when you are done with them, you actually turn them off. Um, if you leave it running for a week, it'll like charge you for a week. Um, so you know, don't freak out too much if you like forget for an hour or two. But like, there's also ways to set it up to automatically turn off. Um, but yeah, so be wary of that. Uh, runway, um, when you sign up, you get $10 for free. Um, I know the guys, and they were like, cool, let's throw you another 20 bucks, um, which is cool. Um, because 
this is how much time that turns into. Um, so if you use the server that I recommend, um, you'll get 4.75 days of time on paper space. Um, now that doesn't mean like if you turn it on like on Tuesday of next week, you only get five days. Like when you turn it off, then that like it's like hours. So basically, you can turn it on or off for a certain amount of time, and you'll be fine. Um, and that should cover everything that I'm going to teach in this class. Um, and actually, like that should that should cover like a couple times of using it. Um, and then you get ten hours of runway. So runway is five cents per minute. Um, but we won't use it in the same way we use paper space. We will use runway to like sort of experiment with different things. And so you don't need it running for hours. So basically, like, Runway is for testing the model. Uh, paper space is for training a model. And again, like, if you're like, I don't really want to do any training. I just want to use stuff that's in Runway. Totally fine. You're going to have 100 bucks of credits that you can use at any other time. Um, so it's going to expire. Like, you just can use these whenever you want. If, um, if we already have a paper space account, can you just apply it to an existing account? Yes. Or so they are supposed to get back to me with a credit coupon which you can then apply to that. And it'll, it'll work on whatever account you have. Um, yeah. So yes, you'll just get a coupon and that'll cover a certain amount of time. Um, cool, so what I'm gonna do is actually let me demo some stuff. Um, basically what I was hoping that we do by the end of today, which seems reasonable because we have about 40 minutes left, is just setting up the paper space account and setting up a runway account. Um, so why don't I, let me just make sure, this is all my notes. Cool, so um, before I jump into the demo, let me just talk about like what we're gonna actually do. Um, so next week, again, we're gonna do style transfers. I'll show a couple examples of style transfers that I've done, um, but essentially what you need are like two images. I would recommend getting more than that, but like a couple images is all you need. Um, style transfers work with, you need a style image and you need a content image. That's it. Um, so the style image can be a painting, it can be an illustration, it can be a texture you found, like you could go out and like photograph stuff and we could see how that works. Um, content is like what you want the image to be in the end. Um, that's it. It's, the, it's literally that simple. Um, and I'll go over some examples of like how you can combine multiple styles, how you can like sort of do things with different weights. But basically for next week, if you like don't want to dig into like doing bigger data sets, start with that. Um, the following weeks you'll need like bigger and bigger data sets. Again, like you don't need to do your own if you just want to like use whatever already exists out there. Um, but if you do, uh, a guy by the name of Golan Levin who teaches at Carnegie Mellon has created like a public doc of like millions upon millions of public image data sets. Millions wrong, millions is wrong. Thousands, <laughs> thousands of public data sets. Um, so you can go through this list, it's linked here. You can go through it like and just start downloading stuff. A lot of times there's like a, a lot of times you have to sign up and give them your email address so they can like track how you're using it. Um, like there are some like pornography data sets and other things where like they want to be a little bit more careful about how people use these things. Um, but there's just like a ton of, actually let me just open it because this, this will actually be good to just sort of see. Um, so image counts on the left here and then links to the data set and then like a basic remark about like what this thing actually is. Um, so 200 species of birds categorized. Um, Links to online images of faces with metadata, lots of image. There's gonna be a lot of images in here. Um, this is a list of like Japanese paintings. Um, I'll show you some of the ones that I use. So the other thing you can think about is like, there's an easy way to pull down every image that someone has produced on Instagram. There are ways to pull down groups of images on Flickr. Like there's a lot of ways that we could like pull stuff. So if you find an image set you're really interested in, we could figure out how to like make make it a a downloadable file as well. Um, but I would maybe start here and just sort of see what's around. Um, you will see like he has here like signed agreement required for access. Some of these you'll have to be like, I work for a university and like give them an email address. Or uh, I actually do work for a university, so if you need a, an edu email address, come find me. Um, but yeah, I would just play with this, and if you're like, I don't know how to actually get these images, like, maybe next week or the week after, like, let's talk about how to pull them down. Um, and if you have ideas of, like, I would love to do something with, like, someone's work in this category, like, we can also look and try to figure out where, to, where these things would be. Um, so my guess is, like, next week, all about 30 minutes of instruction, and then we'll have an hour and a half to play, and that play could be, like, in style transfers, we could talk about how to find data sets, like, we could play with a lot, like, it'll be more, like, open time for us to talk and figure out how to do things. 
Um, this week I just really wanted you guys to get a bunch of ideas and then be like, I would like to do this, or I would like to do this, and then we can talk about it. Um, cool, so the other thing I wanna, um, I would love for us to think about is also like how you could document your own work. So part of this is like what we're gonna be doing is like probably not document on the internet. Like no one write, no one has written about a lot of the stuff that I'm gonna show you. Or like I found it like Googling very random things and found like little techniques. I would love if we could document this more because part of this is also like how can we help other people learn this stuff? Um, so I'm here teaching seven of you um, the stuff I know, but it'd be great if you guys find out stuff that is really interesting that you document that. So um, I'll share this deck and you guys can add notes like as you're exploring things. Or if you have questions, like feel free to dump them in here. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about it. But then like also going forward, I'd love if we could figure out a way to like document some pieces. Um, and let me show you an example of that. Um, so I like very sporadically like write about some of these things. Um, so so I explored like very roughly how to do like a feedback loop within a style transfer. So um, in this case, like here are two images that I provided. So here is this, here is a con, are these both style images? I think these are both style images. Um, but basically it was like, how do I feed them back and forth within each other, right? So in one round, this is the style image. In the second round, this is the content image or the style image. Um, and what happens when you feed them back and forth? So here there's like a cool swipey thing. You can sort of see how they change. Um, I just did this over 10 times. And this was like, this was all I did for document. It was like, here are the images I produced. Um, but I think stuff like this is even really, is enough to get people like, to learn a little bit more about it. Um, as a part of this class, I'm gonna be documenting all the stuff that I teach you guys to do to set up just servers, because even that isn't really well documented. Um, so I'm gonna be trying to do more documentation as well. So there are things that you heard me talk about, but I didn't actually show or there aren't links to please let me know and I will add some links to things. Because um, part of this is like, I think there are more people who would get into this if it were more accessible. Um, and what I'm trying to do is make this more accessible. Um, and I would love if you guys can help with that as well. These images you use here, are they, they're more like illustration. So style transfer works really well with illustration. And we'll talk about why that is uh, next class. But yeah, style transfer is a way um, of actually being able to move some of those illustration pieces across. Um, so in that case, can you do illustration and photo? Or yep. Yep. Um, actually, style transfer is funny because a photo actually won't work well with it. So one of the things we'll talk about next week is like, what exactly is a style? Or what exactly is a texture? Um, what we think is a texture or a style is different than what maybe a machine thinks about it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that next class. And I think that's why it's like, if you come in with like 10 images, like maybe that'll be interesting to like sort of see which ones work and which ones don't. Because I've found that images that I thought were great textures or great styles turn to crap when I send them through a style transfer. And it's like, you sort of have to like take a step back and be like, well, wait, what is it actually trying to learn? Um, so we'll, we'll talk about some of that stuff. Um, but yes, yeah, style transfers work a little bit better with, with, with uh, textures. I mean, the other thing is like, so, um, I'm gonna stop recording really.